And, of course, that was Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, something called Mosaic, recorded in March 1962. Freddie Hubbard, Wayne Shorter, Curtis Fuller, the horns, Cedar Walton, Jimmy Merritt, and, of course, Art Blakey in the rhythm section. That was dynamic. Uh, well, that was probably, you know, that, that band, that particular band of, of the Messengers was probably the, the hottest he had. I mean, he had some awfully good ones before and after, but that was probably the most popular because that's where Freddie came into his own and and Wayne and Curtis. And I used to work, I worked opposite that band a few times, and it was always a ball to listen to. And, uh, but there's art at his best. I mean, you know, the the, the tempo... Everything he did, I mean, you, know, you couldn't, you, you couldn't want, you couldn't want more, you know. And it's, it's a little big band, which Art loves. You, you can hear all that great ensemble playing and how he catches everything and makes it sound like a bigger band than it is. Yep. And, uh, and uh, people loved it. I mean, I, I used to work, Bird, I worked Birdland a couple times opposite this band with um, Jerry Mulligan's concert jazz band, and place used to be packed. I don't know if they were coming to see us or Blakey. You know, it didn't make any difference. It was packed. And it was always fun to sit around out, out there and listen to them. I'd sit and watch art, you know. And uh, and uh, I don't know. It, it, art, art never, you know, when things started to change and, uh, and uh, El but at this point, Elvin was the hot man, you know. Right. And... Uh, and uh, I happen to re I remember that some I won't say who, but there's, it's only a it's only a six man group. But a couple of the guys in this band were uh, complaining that Art they were, I think they wanted Art to play more like Elvin, you know. And I, I said, why? You know, I mean, he, why should he change? Why should he be anything other than what he is? I mean, he's he's been great for years. He's great now, and he's certainly making you guys play. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, you're just looking for something. Uh, I mean, uh, if you think you're not, ex if you think this group isn't exciting, you're out of your minds. I said this group is fantastic, and uh, and uh, I, mean, I don't know. I guess they uh, they just didn't realize what they actually had. You know, of course they were all young. You know, we're talking with Mel Lewis, and this is jazz out to lunch on WKCR FM in New York, eighty nine point nine on your FM dial. Lauren Schoenberg with you, and we're going to be continuing with part seven of the history of jazz drums next Tuesday afternoon. It looks like we'll get to Roy Haynes on that show and more. Uh, we're going to be going to Tiny Khan in a few moments and probably stay with him for the rest of the show. Uh, but right now, I'd like to ask Mel Lewis if I could, if, if you had to sum up, if you had a minute or so, just to right. sum up about Art Blakey and his contribution to jazz drums, how would you sum it up? Well, <clears throat> let's see. Art brought... Uh, he brought what he brought to drum. What he brought to to, to drumming was uh, was uh, to modern uh, small group uh, modern drumming was what uh, Buddy Rich brought to the big band drumming. Uh, confidence, uh, outgoing, personality style. Uh, he he uh, he was probably the, uh, the one of the strongest drummers to come out of the bebop field. You know, I mean, he came on and and he was not afraid to. Uh, to be heard, you know, uh, and uh, he developed a signature that uh, will that nobody has been able to, uh, uh, co you know, copy. Oh, a lot of people do things. See, it's hard to if you copy Art Blakey, it's so obvious that you're copying Art Blakey that uh, you got to feel like a fool to, to even do it because anybody listening would know what uh, man he's copying Art Blakey. They, they hear it right away, and you can't copy Art Blakey's feel. Again, it's uh, it's impossible to to create something new when somebody has already done it. You cannot copy. Uh, and you say, well, could you be influenced by him? Only from the, only, the only influence that I could see that uh, any, he could have on anybody is, is what I just said before, to, uh, to, to play with confidence, to be outgoing, and to inspire, you know, and not be and, and, and to be dynamic, you know, and uh, of course another thing Art has done, you know, I mean we can we can go into the fact that being he's been a band leader all these years, his uh, I mean this has been this is a known fact of course is that his his ears and his and his uh, his ability to develop and find 
uh, fantastic young talents and develop. Uh, and when they join his group, they all end up being known. Now that has to be because of him, you know, because uh, Art has a big following, you know, not for just the group. That when you go to hear Art Blakey's band, you know you're going to hear a good band, you know. But obviously, Art is a very popular drummer. Besides, I mean, has a personality. People like to go hear Art. He's great when he gets on a microphone and starts talking to people. You know, he's he's warm to the people, and he uh, he's got he's got that thing that charisma. You know, uh, he, he reminds me a lot of like Cannonball used to be. You know, reaching the audience uh, when you talk to them, making them comfortable, uh, explaining what we're going to play and who's in my band and why and what and wherefore. You know, and creating a warmth between the audience and the uh, and the group itself. And uh, but Art always, no matter what, never out to try to outdo his group. He always tried to inspire and stay under them and keep them, keep pushing them into heights. And uh, some of the, some of the people that have been with his group, I think, uh, didn't stay long enough because just when they were starting to really make it. See, the problem is a lot of critics would say, start talking about. It seems like all the critics had. Uh, uh, would always go to see an Art Blakey group and hear the new, the new young, uh, uh, whatever, the new young, uh, uh, what's that word that they use? Uh, well, I'll just say new young players, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a... That'll come to you. Yeah, and... and like uh, uh, like uh, Lee Morgan. Uh, new Young Warriors, was that it? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, trumpet players he's developed through the years. Yeah, Morgan. Who might have stayed longer. Of course, mm -hmm. he, he could have. And Hubbard... And uh, Winton. And Terrence Blanchard. And Terrence Blanchard. I mean, these are, they, uh, they, they have a tendency to leave too soon because they start believing the publicity they get, and they get the publicity because they're an arts group, or they wouldn't get it, you know. And they start believing their press, and they start saying, oh, I'm ready to be a leader. And then they get a band, and they can't, and what are they looking for? Then they're all complaining they can't find drummers. Sure, how can you find a drummer after you've worked with Art Blakey? It's hard to find somebody that will make you feel like playing like he did. Yeah. You know. Oh, sure, there's some excellent players around, but to hire him and get him because you're not, you're not, all of a sudden, you're a star when you're in his group, but when you get out on your own with your own group, all of a sudden, you're not a star so much anymore because you have to prove yourself with your group. Your group has to be as good as the group you came out of, you know. And uh, but if you'd stay just a little longer and learn a little more and become a little more famous before you start your group, you know, then uh, by that time uh, maybe you'll have somebody behind you that can get you enough money that you can afford the better players to work with you, you know. Uh, and also they find out that it isn't easy to be a leader when you're young. Blakey's a pro, an old an old timer. He can handle the gaff. There's an awful lot out there. My, I have to go through it. Max Roach goes through it. I mean, I'm talking about the drummer leaders. It's tough, and you have to. It, it's not easy at all being a leader, you know. Period. No, no matter what instrument you play, but especially drums, because you have, your front lines are very important, you know. <clears throat> and they have to agree with what you're, do, what you as a drummer are are doing, you know. Because uh, especially if you're a signature drummer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in case people don't understand what I mean by that, it's, that's a word I picked up from Buddy Rich. That's people like, that have their own unique sound and feel and everything and are recognizable the minute you hear them have what you call a signature. And they're and they're they're few and far between. That's something everybody like to develop. They're and and, the, and they're the ones that we're investigating on these shows. Right. They're, they're, these are the people we're we're working with, we're doing with these shows on because they're they're all so important and they developed on drums the same way people like Lester Young and Coltrane and Dizzy and Miles and all these other people did on their horns. And it's not as easy on drums because uh, you're still an accompanist, and uh, to get us to get. A different sound from other drummers, and uh, use it, utilizing your feel, uh, and and because uh, we all have to play ding a ling or spang a lang. That's that's our job as drummers, you know. And uh, but it's how we do it, what makes it different, you know, and the little things you do and the taste, and how you accompany and how you you know because even a drummer leader has to accompany his so his own people. He's still in the background. You're not out in front. And a drummer that puts himself out in front is not a great drummer. I mean, he's not smart even, you know. 
because that's stupid. If you're going to do that, you might as well just play solo, you know, and forget about it. But uh, you, your group is still in front of you, and you have to play behind them and make and inspire them to be so good that they reflect your personality. And art really did that, you know. And uh, so, I mean, and to, so to sum it up finally is that of art definitely is probably one of the, well, he's definitely one of the greatest drummers that ever lived and still is. And I think that uh, he should feel proud. I'm, I know he does. He's... He loves to play, you know, and he'll, and he'll play right through to the end, too, you know. And uh, yeah. he's certainly given so much, uh, not of just himself, but uh, he's provided the, uh, the whole jazz community with some great players and, of course, his own great playing. You're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, and that's Mel Lewis on Art Blakey. As we continue with the history of the jazz drums, part six, we now turn the page from Art Blakey, who is one of the most well-known, high-profile uh, leader, leader drummers in the history of uh, jazz, to a gentleman who's as unknown and uncelebrated and hard to find on record as uh, Art Blakey is celebrated and well-known. And one of the reasons was that this next gentleman died at a very early age and uh, was a, a pioneer of sorts in a whole nother school of drumming. And we're talking about Norman Tiny Khan. And uh, before we listen to Tiny Khan on record... I'd like to ask Mel uh, just to, to tell us something about Tiny Khan, assuming that I know absolutely nothing about him and never heard the name before. Why should I know in the history of jazz drums about Tiny Khan? Tiny Khan came out of, the, uh, out of, out of, out of a school of uh, musicians out of Brooklyn back in the 40s. Uh, first of all, he's an excellent musician. He played with extreme taste, he could swing his butt off, which was a big butt. That's why they call him Tiny. He was huge. He was a huge man. He was tall. He was funny. And he had a great sense of humor. But he was a wonderful musician. He was a self-taught uh, arranger and wrote some of the best music around at that, at that time. And uh, uh, he, But as big as he was, he had a light touch on the drums. And he's probably, uh, they always compare uh, uh, me to him. They say that, I, that I, I carried on what he had started, and, and uh, only I brought it up to another, I took it to uh, other levels and brought it on uh, to where I am today myself, came out of Tiny. That's possibly true, except, that, except for only one fact, is that I never knew Tiny, when he was uh, doing all these things in New York, I didn't know him. I was in Buffalo. And when I came to New York, he was the drummer in Boyd Rayburn's band. And when I heard him in Central Park for the first time at a free, a free concert, he knocked me out. But I noticed something. I said, my God, we play very similar. Then I opened, I think, the next night at the Savoy Ballroom with Lenny Lewis's band. Right. And Tiny came up there to hear me. And he said the same thing to himself. My God, I, he plays, I, I, we both play very similar. I mean, we both have, and it turned out that we became very good friends and talked to each other. Our influences were exactly the same. We, we dug the same people. We both, real, we both played a lot of small group playing, and when we played in a big band, we brought that same idea into the big band, which is what Tiny was, did at a time when nobody else was doing that, you know, and uh, around in the, in the New York area. Because he never really got much out of New York either because of his size, he couldn't travel on buses. And that's, and through him is how I got on the Boyd Rayburn band. Uh, when the Lenny Lewis thing folded up and couldn't get anywhere, he was in Boyd's band and uh, he and uh, Dave, and uh, Dave Lambert, Buddy Stewart, singers and Kai Wending uh, George Wallington and Curly Russell or it might have been Tommy Potter I'm not sure there uh, were offered a gig at the uh, at the uh, Three Deuces on 52nd Street probably Curly Russell yeah. and but uh, and Tiny who couldn't even get on a bus in the old days, the buses were a lot smaller than they are now. He could not get through the door. 
<laughs> he was that big. Yeah. And uh, he didn't, and he couldn't sit in a seat, you know. I mean, comfortably, the bus was too much for him. So he would have had to drive a car. In fact, he always traveled. When he did travel, he drove. He he had a one of those big cars that had big front door in it, you know. And uh, so he recommended me to Rayburn. They were looking for somebody. And uh, now Maynard Ferguson was already in the band. So when Rayburn, you know, mentioned my name, now, don't forget, in those days, I was Mel Sokoloff. I was not Mel Lewis. And that's what Tiny knew me as. And uh, at that time, anyway. This was in 1948. And uh, so I went with the Rayburn band. I took his place. Yeah. And uh, I fit right in because there was nothing different, you know. We really were very similar in our approach. Yeah. But it was it was like playing with five pieces in a 17-piece band. He he was older than you. Oh, yeah. By what, five, yeah. five, seven years or so. He died in 1953 at the age of 29. And I was like 24 then. Okay, so then he's five years older than you. Yeah. yeah. Which is quite a difference at that point when you're yeah. when you're 20 and 25 or something. Yeah, actually, he was finally he had just he had, he was doing very well in New York in the studios. Mm -hmm. He was playing vibes. He right. was writing. He was playing with Chuck Elliot, with uh, Elliot, Elliot Lawrence's Lawrence. band, yeah. and uh, and then besides all the small group stuff he was doing and uh, writing. Yeah, uh, I said that I guess, but he was writing wonderful, you know. And he just got married. You know, it wasn't easy for a guy that big to find a wife either. You know. Not many women wanted somebody that was six feet six, six feet four or whatever and weighed three or you know three hundred and fifty pounds or more. So he went on a diet. Diet and, pills, and, and he took diet pills and all that, and it it just messed up his heart, and he had a heart attack, one fatal heart attack. That was it, and we lost him. Well, it's Tiny Khan that we're going to be delving into right now. And we're going to begin with something from a small group record session done pretty early in the game, uh, early 47, with Red Rodney and Alan Eager and mm -hmm. friends. And yeah. uh, this is called All God's Children Got Rhythm. All God's Children Got Rhythm, one of the great bebop, uh, a tune that was written in the 30s from a Marx Brothers movie, but was played because of its chord changes. And we'll hear Tiny Khan at up-tempo and listen how... He could play up-tempos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, uh, I, am, I, I mean, I haven't heard this track yet, but... I emphasize that, that he doesn't play loud. He had a, a light touch yeah. for such a big man. Like uh, like a big Sid Catlett, probably, mm -hmm. the same way being Yeah, like myself, you know. Yeah. I mean, because don't forget, for a lot of years, I was pretty heavy, too. Yeah. I'm just finally getting down to my right weight. Yeah. Let's hear it now. Tiny Khan with Red Rodney, 1947. <laughs>
right, not too well recorded in terms of the drums, but still an early example. By the way, that was Serge Shaloff on baritone along with Alan Eager and, uh, and the one and only Red Rodney on trumpet on that track. Yeah. Al uh, Haig on piano. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, every once in a while you hear the cymbals all of a sudden get louder. I mean, I mean, I mean that was the engineer, you know. Yeah. And uh, also in those, you know, this, the, the usual uh, drums are 10 feet away from the horn players and these things. So uh, if I sound a little funny, I'm chewing on a piece of butterscotch, which I think I've told you in a few back shows. These, so it keeps your mouth moist when you're talking a lot. Sometimes I'm talking too much. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, well, that was a good idea. See, that's pretty much the way Tiny played, you know, and he, and, and he used that same approach when he worked in a big band, you know. And he had this uh, one big ride symbol up there. Uh, that same symbol... Later on, when I saw it in, in 48, uh, it had a big crack in it. I mean, a cutout, a piece cut out, and it sounded even better than it does there, but I know that symbol. And uh, Tiny used uh, uh, like 15-inch hi-hats, you know, and Those he played these. The, the, that, the, for that time, it was normal, you know, it was, uh, it was all right. And, uh, but if you notice the way he played the hi-hats, he had that nice loose feel on them. Yeah. And uh, he treated them like a ride symbol. And he played, he used a 20-inch used a, a bass drum, which was small for that time. He used it for everything. Uh, and uh, and he, he was just very relaxed. I mean, if you watched him, it was the same old thing. You see this big guy sitting up there, hardly moving, you know, and, and uh, using the wrist and the fingers to play, you know, not, not the arm and not the body, just sitting back. And, and that's why he could play up-tempo so well. Let's hear something else from Tiny Kind. We're going to come back and talk with Mel a lot more about him. I have some questions I want to ask. But let's hear him right now on a record session with Lester Young, uh, done later the same year. Or pardon me, later, a year later. This is December 1948, so this is after you met yeah. him. Uh, Curly Russell, Chuck Wayne, Gene Denovi are the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and Lester Young is on tenor sax. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hear, we'll hear uh, Sheik of Araby. And you can hear a lot more of Tiny. He's very aggressive on this one. Thank you. 
See, now, obviously, you hear how hot Lester's playing, so he, yeah. he, was, he had to be getting a good feeling from him, you know, which I, I could hear, you know, mm -hmm. he, he was getting... Because, you know, that feel is what's so more... Uh, is probably the most important thing. And uh, uh, the sound of the bass drum. See, I remember how he had that... He played that bass drum. Uh, that bass drum was uh, open, and uh, he had like a little pad, uh, not soft, but a hard pad uh, where his beater hit. And I, I remember, I think Tiny used a cork beater, you know, to, to get that more of a hard attack, uh, hard attack, hard attack on the, uh, on the, on the drum, yeah. you know. And he played, uh, at that point, I know he was playing leady drums, which were not used so much by too many jazz drummers. Sonny Greer played leady and, uh, I mean, the original leady, and he had a silver sparkle set of leady drums, which, which were a little different sound. Later on, he switched to Gretsch. I remember his black pearl Gretsch he had that uh, uh, actually attained practically that same sound. Gretsch became the, the jazz drummer's drum. And at this time, there was no jazz drummer's drum. There was just whatever you played, you played, and it was up to you. And he played leady. And and I, I can hear that little different sound. It's different from Ludwig. It's different from Gretsch. It's different from Slingerland. It's, it's, it's a different kind of a sound that uh, he got on, that, on those drums. Yeah. It was basically him. We just heard the Sheik of Araby, Lester Young, with uh, Gene Denovi, Curly Russell, and uh, Chuck Wayne and Tiny Khan on the drums from the Aladdin label. It's one minute after the hour of 2 o'clock. You're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. Lauren Schoenberg with you on part six of the History of Jazz Drums with our guest host, Mel Lewis. And uh, right now we're going to hear something of Tiny Khan with... Um, Charlie Barnett's big band. Ah. And they announced this is from a broadcast, you know, we tried Mel. Yeah. The sound quality sometimes suffers a little bit, but Mel's remarked it so well that you know, you want to catch drummers really playing their real stuff. You try and get radio broadcasts or live performances where they do things that really don't happen in the studio. Yeah, the studio is always playing a little safe. Yeah. And on the job with the audience out there, you really you, you say, "Hey, you know, yeah. you blow." So this is from a battle of the bands. It was Charlie Barnett's band and Woody Herman's band on the radio with Stan Kenton as the moderator. Uh, this is from July 30th, 1949. You'll hear them introduced with a little bit of talk. And then Claude Rains again. Who wrote Claude Rains? Manny Album? Uh, Manny Album. Yeah. And that's Claude Williamson they're talking about. Right, we, 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 which they say here. Yeah. And this is from a radio broadcast again, Tiny Khan on the drums. If we were to just announce the title of the next number as Claude Rains, you might be under the impression that here was a tune dedicated to the histrionic ability of the movie star Claude Rains. But when we mention that Charlie Barnett's pianist is named Claude Williamson and that the tune features him and that the Rains, in this case, is spelled R-E-I-G-N-S, it comes out something altogether different. But what does come out, I think you'll like, because it's an A1 example of modern music. Claude Rains. <laughs> Thank you. 
Excursions in Modern Music is bringing you today a battle of music between Charlie Barnett and Woody Herman and their famous orchestras. And while the band boys of the two crews are busy reshuffling the stage, supposing we take our microphone away from the confusion here and converse for a couple of minutes with the referee of today's proceedings, a guy who has probably done as much for modern progressive jazz music as anyone in the world today, Stan Kenton. Well, Tom, thank you very much. You know, there's one thing I think we ought to straighten out our passengers on right now. You know, a lot of them probably remember the battles of music from years back when two bands would be booked on the same bill and would spend the evening to blow each other off the stand. The customer's applause, of course, would decide the winner. Gosh, I remember them well, Stan, and they were a lot of fun. Yeah, sure they were, but what I wanted to point out is that our excursion today is not quite that kind of a battle, right? True. Bands like Woody's and Charlie's are too few and far between these days to battle each other, huh? Especially when you realize that both are battling for the same thing, Tom, advancement and progress in the one true art from which this country will say belongs only to this country. Very well put. And uh, now let's talk about you, Stan Kenton. Okay, V, any objections? No. <laughs> All right, well, what have you been doing since your retirement last year? Well, Tom, you know a funny thing? When I brought things to a standstill in New York City last December, I, uh, well, let me put it this way. You know, with a band, you do a great deal of traveling around America, the United States, and Canada. And, of mm -hmm. course, there's always been a lot of intrigue for all of us American citizens here for what goes on below the, the border, so to speak, with our Latin American neighbors. So because of the intrigue with the music and uh, a lot of the customs and so forth, uh, I immediately took off for South America to take a look at things. And I spent, uh, I've probably spent most of the time down there, Tom. I see. How about the music down there? How did it sound? I mean, did you get any well, ideas? Uh, did you feel... Will eventually be incorporated. In of course, we have more of an advantage than they have. I think we have more of the South Americans and the Latin friends up here playing. We are not uh, naturally so unfamiliar with their music as they are with ours. I, I found one thing. There's not nearly as much American jazz down there as we're led to believe. Is that right? Even the cities? I mean, like uh, Buenos Aires and Rio? Well, they most of them strive for their own native music. For mm -hmm. instance, in Argentina, you'll hear the finest tango bands in the world. And, of course, there's nobody that can play sambas like the Brazilians. And uh, I think they stick pretty much to their own music. However, there is a small, rabid interest in jazz and it's no doubt going to grow the same as it has been growing in Europe. Good. Do you think there's a market then for uh, American bands down there? I think so in the future. Tom, maybe now for small combinations, but I really wouldn't advise any large American orchestra mm -hmm. to go down there blowing jazz because I don't believe that there's the popularity is strong enough down there to see. support it. Well, to get back to this country, do you think that modern music here in the United States is in a healthy state? I mean, I'm speaking from the artistic standpoint, I mean, not financially, but, but do you think that, that our music is, is progressing as rapidly as it should? Well, that's very interesting, Tom. You know, I think one thing, you will have to admit that this is true. In the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we in America have heard probably everything done to music that could be done up to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, right today, we are in the process of losing the old and taking on the new. Naturally, there's a great deal of chaos and confusion about the music. But I think, uh, as we'll all admit, out of all conditions like these, when they come to pass and these cycles evolves the new great things, and I think that just over the horizon is the new exciting jazz of America that will probably be something that will mean just as much to the people as the the music meant 10 years ago. Ah, uh, well, do you feel then that, that the field uh, right now uh, in, in modern progressive jazz is, lies in concerts or ballrooms or what? Uh, well, Tom, you're asking me a question. You know, I was always a little bit biased because I said one thing, that we can't really present a fine brand of music unless we have what we might term... Concert Sorry freedom, about that, Stan. <laughs> he, that was a, interesting, though. You know, he's talking say, he could talk a while. Oh, yeah, but that was a little too long. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, uh, now there you heard Tiny Fiery playing in the big band, you know, it's, uh, that's what he really could do. Yeah. But again, it was a small group approach, you know. It's not what you'd call big band drumming, you know, just like when we heard Blakey earlier. Blakey was playing with a small group approach. This is Tiny's version of, uh, this is more of the, uh, uh, but, but, but it's a combination. You see, and it's what it's what you heard me do earlier on the show and the Terry Gibbs things. You know, it's a combination. It's a small group feel. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's lighter, but it's strong. But the fills, now you the fills are, uh, uh, well they're they're they're, uh, I don't know they're they're uh, they're not the same kind of fills you would play in a small group, but basically. Uh, uh, you're coming out now. You're coming out of uh, Sonny Greer and Joe Jones, is where is where who sort of led the way in that kind of uh, thing of filling up the holes in a certain way, you know. But uh, uh, Tiny was doing what he was, you know. The the band can't miss 
when there's a two when there's two beats in there and he's got and he does something, their next their next hit, it's going to be right on the nose. That's the important thing, you know. And of course, it's music. He's play, He's making music. He's making rhythm, and he's making fire. He's creating a lot of fire, you know. And it makes the band shout. Uh, a good drummer, a great drummer, really can inspire a band, you know. I mean, it's. Uh, See, in the earlier days, bands played ensembles, and the drummer just played along and played time, and occasionally he might hit a rim shot here and there. Uh, but to hear, you know, you know all these, uh, well, you really got to think, it, 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 like you would in a small group, uh, with a small group ensemble, like Blakey and his ensemble, you know, and like Max Roach, but he had the small group ensemble, you know. You, you play some... Uh, uh, small group kind of feels only in a big band you got to play them a little stronger you know and your drums have to be tuned deeper and that makes for another sound and of course these are again the days most of the drummers we've been listening to are we're listening in the days of the calf skin right. which creates a, a, a totally different sound that uh, you cannot get even today on plastic it's just impossible to get that depth and that that blend that works with a big band so well it's it, uh he doesn't seem to be making, as we've talked about before, he doesn't seem to be making all the figures with the band. He's making the in-between The in-betweens, yeah. That, that, that but when they hit the but thing. when they hit on two or something like that, well, uh, he catches those with uh, that bass drum and that yeah. big cymbal. Yeah. That, he's, 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 he's getting those. But he's not, but he's letting a lot of stuff float by because you should. You right. can't play everything that they're playing. It becomes, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, you're, you'll, you'll be... You know, uh, it just doesn't sound good to do that, you know. Yeah. Thirteen minutes after two, we're talking with Mel Lewis. This is the History of Drums, Jazz, the History of Jazz Drums, Part 6, on WKCR-FM in New York. 89.9 on your FM dial. Of course, if you want to hear Mel in person, the place to go is down to the Village Vanguard every Monday night, where they're now going, heading towards what will be the 24th year or the 25th? Well, when we fit, no, when we, this next anniversary will be 24. We're going, we're heading towards the 25th. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, at the Village Vanguard, of course, every Monday night. So, you know, I'm sure I would say that the, the talk and the history about the drums is great, but the important thing is to hear Mel Lewis play in person with his own band, and that's at the Vanguard every Monday night. All right, right now we're going to jump to Tiny Khan and a tune that his name is on. He wrote it. He was a talented arranger composer, uh, completely self-taught, yeah. Elliot well, yeah. Lawrence told me. Uh, this is called Tiny's Blues, and it's not the studio version, but some live broadcasts from either the, uh, it wouldn't be Birdland, I don't think, I, I, th I think these are from the Royal Roost. And uh, it's the only live performances by this band. Chubby Jackson shouts a lot, and, and it's really great. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't even know if he's playing bass in the band, probably not. Uh, he might not have been. He used yeah. to do, because he fronted the band a lot, and he'd just stand out there screaming all the yeah. time and yelling and creating, you know, and causing his own. Frankie Socolo and yeah. Al Young, oh, Marty it was a, it was a, yeah, and all the, all the guys and everything. Al Epstein. <laughs> Al Epstein. And, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that was a that was a happy bunch, too. Yeah, yeah Al Epstein. All Brooklyn friends. Yeah. Yeah, and Hoboken and, uh, and Brooklyn and uh, you know it was all it was a, a wonderful band. Yeah, we're going to hear Tiny's Blues, Father Knickerbocker, and then a little commercial they did Lemon Drop, which was a big hit at the moment. And uh, but there's some great Tiny Con drumming. So this is live in a nightclub somewhere in New York City, March fifth, nineteen forty nine. It was the Royal Roost, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm sure it was the That's Royal Roost. It's not somewhere. That was on that was on uh, sev uh, Broadway, and between between. Uh, 48th and 47th is where it was located in a basement. Okay. So I used to hang out there. All right. And this is Chubby Jackson's band live there, and you'll hear uh, Symphony Sid a little bit on the announcements. Tiny's Blues, Father Knickerbocker, or Nick Knickerbopper probably, and then uh, Lemon Drop. Again, we're focusing on the drums of Norman Tiny Khan. <laughs> Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we're back to the Royal Roost, the Metropolitan Barber House, where we bring you the frantic, the most frantic, with the lights and low, the music of the real lockdown groove. And as we told you all week long, it's the great Chubby Jackson and the All Stars. Chubby Jackson and his wonderful band. Let's give him a great big hand. Yeah. 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 